Alrighty, we finished chapter 13 in this final part six with the minor method of characterization covered in this chapter, which is ultraviolet visible spectroscopy, known as UV vis. Yep. That has kind of a, a smaller role in that it doesn't give us information about a whole molecule like IR or MF spec might or NMR in the next chapter, but rather, you know, pulling from you know, energy in the ultraviolet invisible range of the electromagnetic spectrum, it has the appropriate energy to cause electron transitions where we have conjugated double bonds, where it promotes an electron to a higher molecular orbital. Yep. The type that's going on depends on the energy and the wavelength necessary. So that's why we have ranges from both the ultraviolet and the visible, right? UV going from uh, about 180 to 400 nanometers and the visible range from 400 to 780 nanometers yep, for our wavelength. So what exactly is going on with this electronic transition? Okay. We're again looking at conjugated systems as double bonds, so pi electrons typically delocalized okay. and we've got our pi electrons that are in a bonding molecular orbital and an electron gets promoted to the pi star antibonding molecular orbital. And the greater the energy difference here between the bonding and the antibonding molecular orbitals, the larger the transition that has to happen, meaning we need greater energy from the wavelength to come in, right? So it's a, or sorry, greater energy for the excitement. So we need a shorter wavelength, something that has more energy, the larger that gap is. So that's where we'd be pulling for something with, from the UV versus if it's a smaller energy difference, we're dealing with the visible. Yep. So this is what a UV spectrum looks like. Yep. What we do is we find what's known as lambda max. Yep. Lambda max, the maximum absorption, the nanometer reading, right, where the maximum absorption is. You see it start to peak off here. Again, that's from oxygen in the atmosphere. So again, we're typically looking above 200 all the way out to 780. Where is lambda max? Here for methyl vinyl ketone, it's at 219 nanometers. Yeah. But it's always a broad peak here, not sharp like we see in mass spec or like a ketone in IR, yeah, because we've got different vibrational sublevels here. Right? So we've got all sorts of different transitions, electronic transitions that are occurring to and from these different sublevels. Right? Vibrational sublevels are kind of like subshells, more of a quantum understanding that's related to orbital overlap, but they're found in a conjugated system. Yep. So different, a sum of a whole bunch of different transitions, which gives us a broader peak when we're looking at our lambda max. Okay. But we have to have a conjugated system in order to get a reading when we're doing UV vis. Okay. Now, all of these types of molecules that are shown here have the same exact conjugated system. Okay? So they have really similar UV spectra, very similar lambda max. Okay? And that's because they all have the same conjugated system, which is known as a chromophore, okay? which is a key vocab word from this chapter. It's not a ton of stuff to pull out from UV vis, but that vocab word is one of them. What's well, a chromophore? The part of the molecule that's responsible for producing the UV vis spectrum from the presence of conjugated double bonds. And we quantify UV vis spectra using the Beer Lambert law, which you've probably seen in an earlier lab, right? Where A is absorbance, C is concentration, L is path length when you're measuring this thing in a spectrophotometer, and E is the molar absorptivity, which is a characteristic of each compound at the specific wavelength you're measuring. Yeah, it's the absorbance that would be observed for a one molar solution with a one centimeter path length, right? Because then both these two variables become one. Use the classify compounds. But we, when we're processing these samples, we typically want a standard path length, right? Tends to be one centimeter. That can vary as you see some other ones like here and over here, right? But this is what we use when we're taking UV vis, typically made of quartz, right? Though there are some other materials. And another big conceptual takeaway is that the more conjugated double bonds we have, the longer the conjugated system, 
right? The longer the wavelength, meaning it's lower in energy because the more the conjugated system we have, the HOMO, the highest occupied molecular orbital and the LUMO, the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital are closer together, right? That pi and pi star. The greater the degree of the conjugated system, the closer those two energy levels are together. So the less energy it takes to transition between them, meaning we absorb at a longer wavelength, which has lower energy. Yep, which we see here, right? More conjugated, higher lambda max, right? That's a longer wavelength, aka shorter, sorry, longer wavelength, less energy. And again, shown right here, right? Lambda max, going 217, 256, as we continue this on, right? getting lower in energy. So we can use the value of lambda max to estimate the number of conjugated double bonds that we have in a sample. Yeah. And this is just a visual of what I was saying before, right? Going from two to three conjugated double bonds, these two get closer in energy. That's why with enough conjugation, we transition from absorbing in the UV range to the visible range. And that's why we get colored compounds, right? Those colored compounds, the reason we see things with our naked eye, right, are because they are absorbing visible light, like we see with beta carotene or lycopene, these really long conjugated systems that give us different colors. And that value of lambda max can change as you change substituents. Okay, which is another vocabulary word. We had a chromophore before, and now we have an oxychrome. Oxychrome is a substituent that changes both the position and the intensity of the absorption. And typically, both of them are increasing. Okay, not always, but typically. Like OH right, and NH2, those are oxychromes. They have lone pair electrons on them that interact with the conjugated system that they're attached to. Right? They have electron delocalization that increases your value of lambda max. When you deprotonate them, like we see here from going from OH to O, that gives you an extra lone pair. So it's got a greater effect okay? versus the opposite of that when we take the lone pair off of the NH2. Yep. So oxychrome, another vocab word. So if it's not super useful for structure, what do we use UV vis for? Okay? Well, if we can detect a structure being present, right, we can measure the rate of a reaction using UV vis. As long as only one reactant or one product absorbs light at a specific wavelength, then you can track either the disappearance of a reactant, or in this case, the formation of a product over time. Right? You have just your UV spectrophotometer to measure the absorbance at 240, because that's tracking your product, and then boom, you see that product showing up. Okay? Now it's a function of time, instead of a functional wavelength, because you told it to just measure at 240. Same thing here, we set it for 340 and track the disappearance of a reactant. Two ways to measure reaction rate, okay, products or reactants. We can also use it to determine pKa, okay, which is pretty neat. You can determine the pKa if you either your acidic or your basic form of, absorbs light in the UV or visible range. As you track that change, right, the pH is equal to the pKa at exactly half the increase in absorbance. Okay, so here we're going from phenol to phenolate. Phenolate absorbs at 287. Okay, so phenol has the hydrogen, phenolate is deprotonated. So here we're seeing it appear. What's the halfway point? Whatever that pH corresponds to is the pKa. So pretty neat, not a super common use as uh, tracking the reaction rate is, but possible nonetheless, less. Okay. You can also use it to determine the melting temperature of DNA. Okay. So uv -Vis can give you information about the nucleotide composition of DNA because your GC pairs in DNA have three hydrogen bonds versus your AT pairs, which are held together by two hydrogen bonds in those two strands. Okay, so when heated, those DNA strands Right, start to break apart and the absorbance increases uh, because the single strands absorb better at 260 in this case. Your melting temperature is defined as halfway up your absorbance. Uh, so it's used as an estimate for DNA of the uh, 
quantity of the GC pairs. And the more GC pairs you have, the higher the melting temperature because they have more hydrogen bonds. Okay. So three possible uses for UV vis, right? Melting temperature of DNA here, pKa here, but this is by and large the most common one, tracking reaction rate. Know the definitions from this video for chromophore and oxychrome and know uh, quantitatively what it's doing, right? how it's actually measuring the conjugated systems and as we increase the degree of conjugation, the fact that those two energy levels become closer together and we absorb at longer wavelengths because it's a lower energy transition. 